in the land of Shakespeare. To be or not to be. You'd wake to the sound of trumpets and live by the rules of chivalry. Then somebody would invade your land or you would invade theirs. It happened all the time in Europe during the Middle Ages. You know, knights in shining armor galloping to the rescue on powerful horses, right? Well, they were a part of it. Because for every swashbuckling knight, there were dozens of common men who fought hand to hand on the ground, slashing with swords in a muddy, bloody struggle for survival. And when the fighting ceased, they walked and walked and walked. They were the backbone of medieval warfare. They were called the foot soldiers. They lived and fought in the many countries of medieval Europe. These were men who had to look their enemy in the eye and kill them with their hands. If they weren't so lucky, they would die themselves. These early soldiers clothed and equipped themselves with whatever they could afford. If you owned a horse, you would ride. If you didn't, well, you were a foot soldier. God, I wish I had a horse. They lived through a time that began back in the Dark Ages around 700 AD and didn't end until about the 14th century when the Renaissance started. Imagine that, the Middle Ages, these guys still believed the earth was flat and as foot soldiers, they probably believed they were going to have to walk every inch of it. Show the estates! on! Some foot soldiers had military training, others did not. What they shared in common was that they fought on foot and then traveled on foot. Their job was to act as human shields for the army that followed behind them. And so what they shared was fear, fear of physical violence, fear that would make your stomach turn, fear to make any ordinary person want to run away and be thankful to have escaped. Of course, they also had tired feet. We just keep walking and walking, and walking. With 500 years to perfect their soldiering, they had lots of time to think about why they did it. For the most part, they had to. It was their duty to the king under the old system of government called feudalism. Under the feudal system, from England to as far away as Hungary, all the land in each kingdom was owned by the king. A pretty good setup. Well, if you happen to be royalty. Now, the king couldn't use all this land by himself, so he would give out parcels to noblemen and lords. In exchange, the nobles had to provide an armed force to carry out the king's wishes. So they would let common men farm the land on one condition. These men would have to muster under their landlord's banner or flag when they were called for military service. Today, we just pay our landlords the rent. But the arrangement hasn't changed much otherwise. If you didn't pay the rent by showing up for service, you'd get kicked off your farm. Come on, nine. Come on what? Or I'll lose my land? You guys go on without me. I need to tell the people who started this. As most of you may remember from high school, this feudal system really got its jump start because of a man called Charles the Great, or in French, Charlemagne. In 768 AD, when his father died, Charlemagne became king of the Franks. His land included France and most of Germany. Pressing the men of these lands into military service, Charlemagne led a series of campaigns that lasted 30 years. During this time, he conquered a lot. By 800 AD, Charlemagne was king of a huge plot of real estate that covered what are now France, Switzerland, Belgium, and the Netherlands. It also included half of present-day Italy and Germany, part of Austria, and parts of Spain. Basically, by 800 AD, Charlemagne owned Western Europe. He was king now, and if he wanted to have land, he had to provide at least 40 days a year of military service. As a military leader, 
Charlemagne forbade his soldiers against drunkenness and lack of discipline. And the penalty for deserting his army was the confiscation of all a man's property. Well, the drunkenness part didn't hold up that long in Europe, but for 700 years, this feudal system pressed men into military service in order that they could keep land. All this war baloney with kings and castles and capturing knights even inspired a board game, chess. I wonder if modern day intellects know just how much they owe to the medieval foot soldiers who inspired those little pawns. By the year 1050 AD, medieval foot soldiers looked pretty much like this English fellow. He wore no particular uniform, carried a sword, and wore a type of armor called chainmail, among other things. Chainmail was a type of flexible armor that was made by joining metal links together to form a... It's termed a, a hauberk. It's a, a long tunic which uh, reached down to the knees um, with usually short sleeves, although they, uh, th there were uh, extensions that could be put on the sleeves and also extensions that could be used over the legs. But you weren't fully dressed unless you had a padded garment on underneath your suit of chainmail especially if you bruised easily. This garment was called a gamberson. You hoped its padding would absorb the blow of a sword or spear in battle because the chain mail could only stop the cut. It did not stop the impact. In 1066 AD, English soldiers could have used more of this chain mail and a lot more padding. This was the year that they faced off against a bunch of Scandinavians who had recently become their neighbors. They were called the Normans, and they had just settled across the English Channel in France. History books tell us that they were not happy with just their piece of France, which they called Normandy. So under their leader, William the Conqueror, the Normans invaded England at a place called Hastings. Well, the Battle of Hastings was fought over land. It was fought over a little island off the coast of the continent that the continental people really didn't have much attachment to, at least before Hastings takes place. But it was land. William the Conqueror liked land. The English infantry was weary by the time they arrived at Hastings. And guess why? Well, for one thing, they had to walk 200 miles to get there. For another, they had just been fighting in northern England where they had to thwart an invasion from the last of the Viking armies. Vikings, <laughs> talk about a hectic schedule. After that, their leader, Harold, King of England, marched them as fast as he could down to Hastings to stop William the Conqueror. And how about that dazzling knight in shining armor there? I guess he couldn't quite afford the horse. So, there's another foot soldier. The English, under King Harold, were outnumbered. The Normans fought from horseback in a fighting team otherwise known as the or no chainmail to protect them. Armed with long-handled axes, the English foot soldiers managed to hold off the first wave of Normans who engaged them in battle. The battle ended in a rout. In other words, the English ran away. Most battles in the Middle Ages are fought because the foot soldiers flee. You find that in many different battles. Uh, as the cavalry gets closer, cavalry gets closer, suddenly the foot soldiers say, why am I fighting? I'm not fighting for any reason. The money isn't worth it or the obligation isn't worth it. And they turn and they run. Hundreds collapsed in the path of their pursuers. It was reported that many soldiers had no strength to flee, so laid down to die in their own blood. A poet wrote that the hooves of the horses exacted punishment from the dead English foot soldiers as the Normans rode over them. This is how a three-century Norman occupation of England, Wales, and Scotland began. And it all started when the foot soldiers were forced to run away from a better equipped and more numerous force at the Battle of Hastings. Engage! Engage! 
When you think of a medieval sword, do you think of a kinder, gentler, more good-natured style of warfare? Well, think again. Ha! These things were made to cut a man in half. They were ferocious instruments of death, and apparently not bad at cutting watermelon. With one quick slicing motion, a skilled swordsman could sever an enemy's arm or lop off his head. Now, all this power didn't come cheaply either. A sword like this might have cost the equivalent of $20,000 by today's standard. But if you're going to ravage towns and lay siege to castles, well, you don't want to go for the barbarian bargain basement knockoff. Slice anyone? Pay retail. All sword prices slashed to the bone. Up to fifty percent off all genuine and forged iron swords. Use them for cutting your enemy or thrusting through that weak spot in his armor. Use with one hand or two. Chain mail and helmets at similar savings. Everything must go. One fortnight only at Durham Cathedral, 14th century in England. Okay, so maybe it wasn't that easy for a medieval foot soldier to get a hold of a sword of his own. Fact is, though, he was a lot more deadly on the battlefield if he could afford one. The effectiveness of the uh, later medieval sword as a killing tool is quite remarkable. Here, uh, we see the full development of the, the knightly sword, where you have two long sloping sides which are ideal for cutting and they come to a nice point which make it good for thrusting. So if you were fighting somebody wearing armor you could sort of winkle between the plates. You could look for a, a break in the uh, in the chain mail and thrust into it. Ah. <laughs> Medieval swords were the product of a simple technology that succeeded in making pretty powerful weapons. Some swords were as tall as a man and so heavy they had to be swung about with two hands if they could be lifted at all. In the 13th century, a cousin of the sword called a falchion became popular for its short broad blade that could split a head open like, well, like a watermelon. By the mid-14th century, when armor was more common in battle, cutting blades became less useful, and the most popular type of sword was forged with a familiar narrow blade. It had a strong central rib and a short point ideal for thrusting. A medieval foot soldier used all parts of his swords and body to put his opponent out of commission. Sure, he used the tip of the blade to stab with, but he also used the pommel or knob of the handle to bruise with. If he had a shield, he'd punch with it. If he dropped his sword, well, he might resort to biting and scratching. But then, he could expect to lose. The man still holding his sword at the end of the fight was usually the winner. Swords also had a lot of symbolic value to a foot soldier. Carrying one around was the modern-day equivalent of driving a Ferrari. If you had one, you were bad, and the maidens would be all over you. Of course, swords weren't just a symbol of wealth and status. Even though other weapons might prove to be as deadly, no other weapon in the Middle Ages symbolized the power to conquer and to lead more than the sword. Traditionally, when an army or garrison surrendered, they would present their swords to their captors as a plea for mercy. The best way to get a sword was to be born wealthy and become a medieval gentleman soldier. Chances are good that you would be given one by your king. This happened during a ceremony that turned you from an ordinary guy into a knight. Knights were the military elite in the Middle Ages. Although you'd expect them to ride horses, they often fought on the ground right next to the humble foot soldier. There was another way that a foot soldier could procure himself a sword. That was to kill a knight or other better equipped soldier from the opposing side and take his equipment. This was actually one of the rules of medieval warfare. It was that time-honored foot soldier tradition called taking booty. If you captured someone, their goods became yours. In other words, if you as a foot soldier 
very unlikely, but if you captured a knight, his armor, his horse, and his weapons became yours. Right knight was like winning the jackpot in Las Vegas. This is because the rules of medieval warfare allowed for a lowly foot soldier to cash in a captured knight for the ransom money his family would pay to get him back alive. <gasps> Still, if you were a common medieval soldier and you hadn't captured a knight, you'd have to make do with more rudimentary armaments. One of these was called the Morning Star. This baby meant business and could cause a real headache right through your helmet. This type of weapon called a, a Morning Star, because of the, the spikes that are on it, it looked like a, a star, was uh, really quite devastating. It perhaps would not kill as such, but it would certainly incapacitate. But uh, something like this, uh, would be extremely effective because with the swing that you get as you hurl it about you can get far more pressure on the point of contact of a helmet or a breastplate or, or a piece of armor uh, and you have no shock that you would have if you were holding a sword and, and you strike something where the, the shock would transfer itself from the blade through your arm here there's no such thing all of the shock all of the pressure goes into the head of this mace and will be transferred to your opponent. Another weapon in the common foot soldier's arsenal was his billhook. The soldier who carried one was called a billman. The billhook probably started out as just a farm implement attached to a long pole. But it would be refined into a dual-purpose weapon that could stab with its sharpened tip or hook onto the armor of an opponent and pull him off his horse. Once you had him down, you pulled out your dagger to finish him off. A dagger can be used in several different ways. It can, of course, be used as a slashing weapon, but not very often was it used as a slashing weapon. Most often, a dagger was used to penetrate the impenetrable armor in some way. The armor was weakest underneath the arm, and so a dagger could be used to insert in the arm or in the groin. Most often, however, a dagger was used underneath the helmet to cut the throat. Charming. But that's not the end of it. An even more lethal weapon was about to change the face of medieval warfare. It was the most deadly and feared of the Middle Ages, the crossbow. The foot soldiers had made home movies of themselves in camp. They would have looked something like this. The soldiers slept in tents and cut their tent poles from nearby trees rather than carrying such heavy lumber throughout a campaign. Meals were simple but hearty, and they were supplied by people called vittlers. Little is known of how they cooked, but you can bet it wasn't hot cuisine. Their food consisted of boiled mutton or beef with beans or peas. The men also had salted pork, fish and cheese, bread, and of course, beer. In fact, part of an English foot soldier's rations included one gallon of beer a day. Not surprisingly, drunkenness was a problem in camp. And of course, there were the requisite camp followers. Camp followers in the Middle Ages were uh, largely individuals who could service the soldiers. And when I talk about service, I'm talking about laundry, foodstuffs, and sexual gratification. Uh, we always read about a large number of prostitutes in the uh, in camps. Laundry. Yeah, right. In fact, prostitution among medieval soldiers was such a problem that any such camp follower found within two miles of camp would have her left arm broken as punishment. If anyone else finds out I'm here, they'll break me bloody arm. So to keep the foot soldiers' minds on battle, they would drill to practice their attack skills and war cries. These cries were important and very pleasant to listen to. They served as a means of recognition and collective identity among these battle-ready warriors. Hey, that guy's got a good backbeat. 
Battles were really unusual during the Middle Ages. They were considered sort of a last resort. It was the siege that dominated medieval warfare. To lay siege in the Middle Ages meant for an army to surround and blockade a castle or city and attempt to capture it. For this reason, castles were built like fortresses. They had moats and steep hills around them. Towns were often built behind high walls and had defensive towers for soldiers to fight from. Still, the siege was a useful strategy if, say, you were an English king and one of your landholding noblemen was rebelling against you in a nearby city. Or maybe you just wanted to acquire more land for yourself a little further away, maybe in France. The best bet for either was a siege. Why was the siege such a good way to conquer land and vanquish an uprising? Because both were usually controlled from a castle, sort of like the Pentagon, only no phone. So medieval soldiers would camp out around a castle or town and just wait for the people trapped inside to give up. Some sieges lasted as long as six months. Starvation inside the city or castle walls could be a very persuasive tool of conquest. But if that was taking too long, there were plenty of other tried and true methods of taking over. They all involved some sort of weaponry. Well, a ladder is the simplest and perhaps the oldest uh, form of, of uh, siege uh, weaponry the world knows. I mean, all it is is simply to put it up against the wall, climb up and all over. Problem is, is that somebody on the other side is trying to keep you from actually climbing up the ladder and over the wall and into, and into his fortification. Ah! Oops. <laughs> of course, those medieval shoes were sure not much help. Old movies point out just how dumb it was to use a ladder to invade a castle. And so, variation on the ladder technique was developed called the siege tower. Built by special carpenters called siege engineers, these tall wooden structures allowed an invading force to attack from above the castle walls. familiar battering ram also made an appearance at any well-attended siege. This one is even fashionably dressed like a ram. Usually these batter, battering rams would, would be only of, of wood. We don't have a lot then left over. Every once in a while we have these, um, some form of large stone or metal uh, object that appears to have been the, the, the point of the battering ram. And you simply pound with this wood over and over and over again on a spot on the wall until you cause a fissure or you call it cause some form of breakage. Even more breakage could be caused by one of these. This great stone throwing machine was called a siege engine or trebuchet. And what they did was hurl heavy stones like cannonballs against a castle wall. Scholars tell us that some of these siege engines could launch a 33-pound stone across the length of two football fields and then smack into the castle. The medieval soldiers also experimented with hurling beehives over the walls to create panic. Sometimes, really crafty soldiers flew dead animals into the castle to try and spread disease, an old trick they picked up from the Romans. But there was one weapon that could be used by a soldier from behind the safety of a castle wall to strike awe and fear into his attacker. Good day. I'm Master Vance, captain in the service of His Grace the Duke of Gloucester. This is a crossbow. It takes considerably more time to load and fire than a longbow. But uh, it only took me a week to learn how to use this rather than a lifetime. The way I load it is place my foot through this stirrup here at the bottom. Place in catch to stop me depressing the trigger. Take a firm grip of it and using both my back, my legs and my arms. Straighten and put it over the catch. Take a quarrel or bolt. Place it in, I'm ready to fire. <laughs> 
medieval crossbows were made in two basic designs. One called a windlass, employed a pulley, and cranked to slowly stretch the bowstring into firing position. The other style was smaller and used the soldier's foot in the stirrup to give the bowstring its lethal stretch. Well, a crossbow, I think, was pretty deadly in combat. Uh, a crossbow it would deliver a bolt, very, very sharp, with a very sharp um, uh, point on it, at a very high velocity into an oncoming soldier. And that would tend, with this amount of power, and depending upon the pull of a crossbow, it would penetrate most every armor that it could encounter. Chain, plate, uh, cloth-covered armor, almost anything. The problem with the crossbow, of course, was not the penetration capability. It was the aiming. So how did they overcome this aiming problem? By simply firing as many crossbows as possible at the same target at the same time. The French would accompany this with the sounding of trumpets to cause further fear in their enemy. The hail of arrows or bolts was bound to hit something. If the shot itself wasn't deadly, there was always infection and disease to finish off a wounded medieval foot soldier on the battlefield. But there was another more brutal and fearsome form of fighting in medieval times. It was called the melee. Well, when it came time to rest, comfort was hardly a, a priority for the medieval soldier. Battle readiness was. And camp was sometimes a hasty affair. Tents were very scarce. He had no pajamas. And on cold nights, if he was lucky enough to have a suit of armor, he might have to sleep in it. Well, if that wasn't relaxing enough, he'd also have to try and hold on to a horse for his cavalry so they could ride into battle the next day while the foot soldiers got to walk, if they weren't too stiff. <laughs> Even if he was feeling lively in the morning, a foot soldier in a suit of armor was in for a tiring day. Sure, he was well protected from any arrows or spears that might be flying in his direction. But armor was heavy. A full suit of this stuff could weigh as much as 70 pounds. The English cleverly measured their weight in stone. They figured an average size stone weighed about 14 pounds. That made wearing the average suit of armor feel like you had just hung three to five hefty stones onto your arms, backs, and legs, and then gone marching. It's bloody hot in here. This stuff weighs three and a half stone. And I'm wearing wool. Putting armor on wasn't much easier than walking around in it. In fact, it could take as long as two hours and require a bit of help. To see how it was done, we set up our time-lapse armor cam in front of a castle door. Then we watched and waited. Those guys helping him get dressed were called his squires. Those leg protectors he's putting on are called his greaves. Looks like he's stepping into his chainmail skirt for a little extra protection. Now he's lacing up the breastplate. Deep breath, not too tight. Now for the gauntlets. Those are his arm and hand protection. Shoulder protection, which they called pauldrons, fit just like football shoulder pads. Of course, no well-dressed knight would go out without his gloves, right? Sword, check. Next comes the helmet. But wait, there's still one final intimidating accessory. The feather. Okay, he's ready to rumble! It only took him 15 minutes. Awake, awake! Awake, awake! Battle cries served another purpose besides giving the soldiers a sense of identity. They could intimidate and frighten an enemy. Preliminaries are over. It was time to get down to business. 
can imagine the paralyzing fear that gripped each and every foot soldier. With all other forms of diplomacy exhausted, the men faced off, ready for a chaotic bout of fighting called a melee. It was the most violent spectacle you can imagine. This was an all-out brawl where there would be screams and cries and the sounds of bill hooks ripping flesh, swords clashing against shields, and maces crushing skulls, spears and lances pierced the warriors' armor, and knives were thrust right through the eye sockets and into noses. The smell of blood hung in the air, and the only rule was to survive and kill. Well, there was also a rule that said that you could flee, and that's really how some melees ended. The battlefield quickly littered with men dead, dying, and running away. Usually there, there would be a withdrawal. You would be looking at banners. This is the main thing. You would look to the flags of your own side to see where they were. After all, they were your rallying point. And you would look to the, the flags of the opposing side to see where they were. You could sort of work out whereabouts uh, the battle was going. Uh, this was a street brawl not a game of chess. So once you'd won, you tended to know it. Battles in medieval times never usually took very long, usually a matter of minutes or hours. But a war, on the other hand, could last for years, full of petty grievances, land skirmishes, and conflicts that could flare up at any moment. In 1337 AD, fighting erupted between King Edward III of England and Philip IV of France over land that England owned. The problem was this land, called the Duchy of Guyenne, was actually over in France. This touched off a war between England and France that would last longer than the two angry kings who started it. It's called the Hundred Years' War, but who's counting? It probably lasted even longer. One of the most memorable battles for foot soldiers in this war took place in the northern French town of Cressy in 1346. It was here, as King Edward III of England prepared to battle the French, that he added a group of soldiers to his army who were ingeniously armed with a simple peasant's hunting weapon. They were the English longbowmen. An English longbowman was the state-of-the-art weapon for his time. Uh, he had to have a target to shoot at, but when he did, he could shoot constantly, accurately, and with devastating effect. He had different types of arrows for different types of targets. He practiced every day. The English were generally outnumbered when they fought the French, and also not as well equipped. So longbowmen made a great deal of sense for the English. Positioned at some distance from the enemy, they were cheap to outfit because they didn't need armor or carry swords. Plus, these bows and arrows cost very little to make. Add to that the fact that these archers had great aim and could reload and shoot almost constantly, it became apparent here at Cressy that the English indeed had a formidable weapon in the longbowmen. I'm the best of these, an English longbowman, the best in the world. Mm -hmm. Nowhere was that claim more apparent than at Cressy, as an army of 60,000 French soldiers stumbled upon the English, whose archers had assumed a formation in the shape of a funnel. Their arrows were tipped to pierce chainmail armor. As each wave of French knights and foot soldiers charged into the funnel, they were met with clouds of English arrows that flew from three sides. The result? was slaughter. The English lost less than 200 men, but the French lost between 10 and 20,000. The unsure number, because nobody bothered counting foot soldiers in those days. But at least 6,000 dead knights had fallen and were accounted for. It made the English archer feel very, very good indeed. Uh, in fact, um, uh, there is a, a, an insulting gesture in England of raising two fingers. This came about uh, because uh, the French, the French king, put out an edict that any English archer captured would have three fingers from his right hand removed so that he could never again fire a bow. <laughs> 
So the idea of sticking your fingers up at someone is an insult that has a very long history. Nearly a hundred years later, in this very long war, came a French peasant girl named Joan of Arc. Joan claimed to be inspired by religious visions to instruct the French army in the defeat of the English longbowmen during a standoff in France at a place called Orléans. She pointed out the oh-so-clever strategy that goes like this. If you go around the side of a longbowman instead of walking straight at him, he is vulnerable as anyone else with no armor. Hey, I'm not quite dead. Bless that Joan of Arc. I'm an archer. I was supposed to win. And so is born the phrase, you win some and you lose some. Joan of Arc, of course, was later captured and burned at the stake by the English. But then in 1920, the church declared her a saint. Now, if this was payback time, it was a little late for poor Joan to appreciate it. But still, there were weapons to come that even Joan of Arc could not have envisioned. Medieval foot soldiers would soon enter the age of gunpowder. Remember Henry VIII, big guy, king of England? He used to throw half-eaten turkey legs over his shoulders. You know, the one who decapitated a few wives. Well, his predecessor, King Henry V, did some pretty rotten things in his day, too. As soon as he was crowned King of England in 1413 AD, Henry V decided to heat up the still smoldering Hundred Years' War and go invade France. So, after a short boat ride across the English Channel, about 10,000 soldiers arrived in France ready to march. They encountered little resistance from the French. And King Henry figured he'd be having dinner in Paris in a couple of nights. In the meantime, the foot soldiers drank from the local streams and ate shellfish that they found near the shore where their boats had landed. You wouldn't do that today because you might get sick. Well, guess what? The English came down with what they called the bloody flux, otherwise known as dysentery. The foot soldiers walked and struggled for days. By the time they reached a town called Agincourt, the site where they would face a huge French army, no one had been spared the indignity and discomfort of this cursed affliction. So when the French charged, many of the English soldiers were so ill, they were forced to fight without their trousers. It's not quite the same thing as, uh, as fighting uh, without trousers would be today because uh, the tunics were fairly long and came down to mid-thighs. If you were in that position of uh, having dysentery, then you could just unfasten your leg wear, push it down, and uh, stand where you needed to fight and do what you needed to do. Despite their weakened state, the English archers held off the first wave of French cavalry with a storm of arrows. Those French who were not hit turned their horses around and charged into their own army to get away. With the French half beaten and in retreat, the English were able to rest a moment and regroup. When the fighting resumed, the archers again held their ground. But when they ran out of arrows, the battle turned into a melee. Fighting with axes, swords, and bill hooks, the English reverted back to their earliest methods of warfare and miraculously forced the French into retreat. The French lost 10,000 that day at Agincourt, compared to a loss of only 100 English soldiers. You may never know if these deaths were caused by battle or the shellfish. What we do know is that hundreds more French were taken as prisoners, and the English foot soldiers had started to think about ransoming them back to their families. But Henry V had other ideas. After the battle, the foot soldiers began to march their prisoners home. The French outnumbered the English six to one, and Henry V was losing all his men. The French could still charge with their horses and move into victory. So the king ordered the prisoners killed killed because Henry V needed his troops back. This killing was an affront to the rules of medieval warfare. But the rules were in for some astounding change. The next change would arrive explosively. It would forever alter the nature of armed conflict. It was deadly 
made a lot of racket when you used it. This was gunpowder. The original guns uh, were almost like um, bottle rockets with the explosive charge in the bottle rather than the rocket. And they fired a thing like a spear. Uh, this was reasonably effective, but uh, it was only uh, when people started developing the tube and using a round shot that artillery began to really come into its own. By 1415 AD, the picture of a medieval siege now included early artillery cannons that were called bombards. They could fire stone balls that weighed nearly 800 pounds into the wall or gate of a fortress and smash it. One bombard did the work of 20 foot soldiers with a battering ram or catapult, and it was faster. These were the top guns in medieval times. When cannonballs couldn't be found, the English army would shoot millstones out of their cannon. Enormous slabs of stone would fly toward the wall, gouge huge pieces out and shatter it. The flying pieces acted like shrapnel. Anybody in the way would be showered with sharp stone fragments. Further refinements on the cannon led European gunsmiths to craft the harquebus. It was a handgun with a long barrel that was loaded with gunpowder and a ball just like a cannon. It was then aimed and fired with the aid of a lighted fuse or match. By the time it got to the, the 1470s, in fact, we begin to see battles that are taking place with handgunners facing handgunners in almost a modern concept. Uh, it isn't completely without its medieval, uh, its medieval constructs. Suddenly, foot soldiers now uh, arrive in battle, not with lances, not with swords, not with spears, but with handguns. It's changing the face of warfare. An archer takes years to train. And in the course of a day's battle, he'll shoot half a wagon load of arrows. I can carry here all I need, powder, priming powder and shot. I can carry enough to shoot half a day on me. Gunpowder weapons had been out 150 years before the Middle Ages ended. But they spelled the end of medieval warfare as soon as they appeared. Slowly, soldiers began to rise up in rank based on their skill with a firearm instead of how much armor they could afford or whether they had a horse. Bill hooks and swords would become obsolete along with catapults and chainmail armor. The age of chivalry was over. But despite the changes on the battlefield, there would always be a need for men who fought on their feet for the glory of their country. And so, the evolving world of warfare, there would always be the foot soldier. Medieval warfare was hard, grueling, and a royal pain in the arse. Sure, there was the glamour of colorful flags, the sounds of trumpets, the glitter of armor, but it was mostly mud, brutality, and terror. Kind of like slam dancing at Woodstock 1266 AD. This was a time of legendary heroes but it was also a time for ordinary men to win the day and carry the weight of history. 